Box plots display a wealth of useful information about the dataset. So let's start with the most basic box plot. Build every part of this notched violin box plot in ggplot2 step by step and understand why every detail matters. For instance, the basic box plot provides a five number summary of the data. To create the basic box plot, we'll load necessary packages and obtain the which dataset from the ISLR package, which contains information about American salaries. We'll then use the ggplot function with two arguments, the data and the aesthetic mappings, where we put a numeric column we want to study. Finally, we'll use the geomboxplot function to create a box plot itself, which is the five number summary for wages. The five number summary from bottom to top is represented by the minimum wage, which is the end of the lowest whisker, first quartile or the lowest horizontal line of the box. It's also called 25th percentile because 25% of all the data is located between the minimum and the lowest line of the box. Median is the thick horizontal line in the middle of the box, which splits all the data in half and also the data inside of the box in half, so that both sub-boxes have 25% of the data even if they look completely uneven. The median is sometimes called a second quartile or 50th percentile. Third quartile is the highest horizontal line of the box. It's also called its 75th percentile because 75% of all the data is located between the minimum and the highest line of the box. And finally, the maximum wage as the end of the highest whisker. The box itself covers the middle 50% of the salaries. It goes from the first to the third quartile that's why we call it the interquartile range. The whiskers stretch the box to the lowest and highest values, but exclude outliers, giving us a really good idea of what we could generally earn. However, salaries of folks with different education levels, professions, etc. would differ, right? That leads us to the second benefit of box plots. Box plots show how a variable changes across groups or categories. For example, to create side-by-side -side box plots that compare the distribution of wages across different education levels, we'll put education levels on the x-axis and salaries on the y-axis. This box plot shows us that higher education levels lead to higher salaries. Half of the people with the highest degree earn more than almost anyone with the lowest degree. So, education matters. Also, big boxes mean high variation in salaries, which offers more opportunities to earn money, while small boxes mean low variation of salaries, implying less room for career growth. The people with the lowest degree are stuck with low pay, and the median of the lowest education level is very close to the lowest hinge of the box. This means that the distribution is skewed towards lower salaries so that the average salary in this group is misleading. It's simply too high. And there are only two exceptions. Two people who earn as much as college graduates. And this leads us to the next benefit of box plots. Box plots emphasize outliers. But what is an outlier and why does it matter? In brief, outliers are data points significantly different from the rest lying beyond one and a half times the interquartile range from the nearest box hinge. While outliers are often errors, they can also result from unusual events or provide new and interesting insights. Therefore, outliers do not always need to be removed. However, if a point falls outside three times the interquartile range, it can be deemed extreme and should most likely be excluded from the dataset. In any case, both extreme points and outliers can skew our results and should therefore be emphasized, which can be easily done by specifying the color, size, and shape of outliers inside the geomboxplot function. The only problem with this boxplot is that sometimes we want to know the exact values of outliers 
or the 5-point summary. However, we have to guess it by staring at the y-axis, but there is a solution to it, namely to make our plot interactive by first loading the Plotly library, then wrapping our R code into ggplotly command, and pointing to the extreme earners in the high school grade, the Steve Jobses or Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, or finding out the median and quartiles in order to confidently understand what 50% of people earn. Speaking of confidence, while the median represents a more robust measure of central density compared to the mean, to enhance our confidence in the median, we can effortlessly add 95% confidence intervals to it. This is displayed as a notch around the median on the box plot. To achieve this, we simply include the notch equals true argument inside the geomboxplot command. The notch is important for two reasons. The first is overlapping. Namely, if notches of neighboring box plots overlap, there is a strong evidence that samples don't differ. On the other hand, if the notches don't overlap, it indicates that the samples might differ significantly. However, only a real statistical test can confirm this, and we'll get to that at the end of the video. The second reason the note is important is that it gives us a hint about whether our sample size is too small or sufficiently big. Here is how we know. The note is calculated as the median plus or minus 1.57 times the interquartile range divided by the square root of our sample size. So, if the notch stays inside the box, our sample size is sufficiently big and we can trust our data. But if the notch goes outside the box, we cannot trust our data because our sample size is too small. And since sample size is so crucial, displaying it will make your box plot even more informative. And there are two ways to add sample size to every plot – implicitly and explicitly. The implicit way is similar to notches, where we do not show the real numbers. Using the var with equals true argument inside of the geomboxplot function, we'll adjust the width of every box, scaled by the square root of n. The wider the box, the more data it contains. However, it's always more useful to see the actual numbers. To achieve this, we'll first count the number of observations per education group and save it in a separate small data frame. Then we'll use this data frame to display discrete labels on the x-axis below every box plot, including the name of the education group, a division fraction represented by backslash n, the text n equal, and finally the actual numbers themselves. And if we look at the result, we'll confirm that the widest box corresponds to the highest number, while the narrowest box represents the lowest number. Here is an important detail. It is highly recommended to have at least five observations per group for the box plot to be useful. Now, as the code becomes more bulky, adding new features to the plot may become overwhelming. To streamline our programming journey, we can save the code we are satisfied with into a separate object at any point and use it for further modifications. For example, we could use P to add the violin plot. Why violins? Well, violin plot might be even more informative than box plots because they show the distribution of data along both the horizontal and vertical axis, revealing its shape, symmetry and spread. This can be used to identify the most common wage values, the number of peaks, and to see whether the data is skewed or symmetric or normally distributed. If we overlay the violin on top of the box plot, they would overlap. However, we can make the violin transparent using the alpha argument, which ranges from 0 to 1. The closer alpha is to 0, the more transparent the violin becomes. The usefulness of the violin plot lies in implicitly showing the data points. However, even though we don't necessarily need to see the data points, 
there are times when we still want to explicitly visualize them. Now listen to me very carefully. Avoid using geom point and geom jitter to display points. Those commands are found in many tutorials and I have used them too until I found a much better choice. Geom Sina from the GeForce package where Sina stands for strength, victory and beauty. Here we can see that the points now completely fill out the violin, which makes more sense compared to Geom Point or Geom Jitter. However, they completely overshadow the box plot. Thus, similar to the violin, we can first make the points more transparent by applying the alpha argument and then go one step further and paint them in different colors to literally make our plot a bit more aesthetic. Having all those beautiful points is amazing. However, one of the most important points is still missing. The average. To display the mean, we'll use the start summary function, set the fun data argument to mean cl boot, and the geom argument to point. And finally, we'll color our average blue and increase its size to make it stand out on the plot. However, an average without confidence intervals, it's like a political statement. Sounds very confident, but nobody is confident it will be done. So displaying confidence intervals around the mean is as important as displaying the notches around medians. For that, we'll use the same command, stat summary, with a new argument, geom error bar. Adding the average with 95% confidence intervals makes any plot even more informative and elegant. And it's not only my opinion. Namely, a scientific paper about visualizing samples with box plots published in Nature says, Box plots may be combined with sample mean and 95% confidence intervals error bars to communicate more information about samples in roughly the same amount of space. What information is it, you might wonder? Well, let's check this out by making this plot interactive with ggplotly again. According to the highest education degree, we should earn $143,000 on average. But since the median with the $133,000 is far below the average and not even inside the confident bands of the average, and since the widest part of the violin, which shows what the majority of people earn, is also far below the mean at $119,000, reporting the average salary of $143,000 on skewed data will overpromise and disappoint. That's why I personally get a bit skeptical when any source reports averages instead of medians. But I would be interested to know what you guys think, so feel free to let me know in the comment section below. Now, if this plot is not looking nice enough to you yet, you can quickly improve its appearance by choosing a new plot design with a single command. Here are some useful themes for your convenience. Then you can specify titles, captions and access names within the labs command. And finally, you can move or remove the legend Adjust color, size, font or even the location of text on your plot. For instance, we can choose the Time New Roman font on our plot to match the text font in our publication. It's just effective. But we are just scratching the surface because the next thing you learn will absolutely blow your mind. But before we lose this beautiful plot, I want to show you how to save it. Once you are satisfied with your visualization, you can save it using the ggsave command in your preferred format, quality and size. And if you are satisfied with this video so far, consider hitting the like button. Now, while visualizing education levels is already very insightful, we can go one step further and add two more variables to our plot. Yes, we can. By employing the facet grid or facet wrap function with two additional categorical variables, we can generate distinct subplots, each representing different combinations of these categorical variables. 
And these additions provide even more useful information, but also introduce some problems. First, R warns us that notches went outside hinges, primarily due to small sample size, causing larger confidence intervals than the box itself. It's advisable not to rely heavily on these 95% confidence intervals for the median in such situations and avoid notches unless they fall entirely within the interquartile range. Although we initially followed this advice, splitting our plot into four subplots resulted in incorrect sample sizes on the x-axis. Thus, we need to either replace or remove them. For instance, let's eliminate the entire scale x discrete command along with all the labels. Next will incorporate more data by using the entire wage dataset instead of the small portion we selected initially. Since too many points could be too dark, we'll increase the transparency of points by setting the alpha parameter closer to zero. And just for fun, we can add a horizontal green line to indicate the total average salary across the whole dataset allowing us to absorb how people's earnings compare to the average. So, notched box violin plots are great for visualizing and comparing the distribution of different groups. But how can we test whether the differences are statistically significant? What if I told you that you can do that with just four words of code? Yes, you heard me right. With only four words, you can perform both Bayesian and Frequentist ANOVAs on your data and even show pairwise post hoc tests on the same plot. And if you want to learn how to do that and how to interpret every number on this plot, check out my video on ANOVA.